Good morning and welcome to the first lecture of the Norfolk Society of Arts 2021-2022 lecture season. My name is Alice Kozial and it's my pleasure to serve as president of NSA. It's unfortunate and disappointing that we're still unable to meet in person, but I'm extremely pleased that we are able to provide you virtually the first lecture of our season. I hope each of you received your membership invitation in the mail in late August or early September. If you did not receive your invitation and you would like to join NSA, please visit our website at NorfolkSocietyOfArts.org. Your membership enables us to bring you the world-class speakers that you have enjoyed year after year, and we thank you for your support. This morning, I'm delighted to welcome Anne Dumas, Curator at the Royal Academy of Arts London, as well as Consultant Curator of European Art at the Museum of Arts Houston as our speaker. Anne is a specialist in 19th and early 20th century European art. She gained her PhD from Portal Institute of Art at London University. This was followed by a research fellowship at the Guggenheim Museum, New York, and five years as assistant curator at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. She has curated many exhibitions at the Royal Academy of Art in London over the past 20 years, including Van Gogh, The Artist and His Letters in 2010, and Painting the Modern Garden, Monet to Matisse, in addition to exhibitions on Degas, Matisse, Vallotton, and other artists at the Metropolitan Museum, New York. Anne joined the staff of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in 2019, October of that year. And yet she also continues in her longstanding role of over two decades as curator at the Royal Academy of Arts in London, dividing her time and her responsibilities between Houston and London. We're enormously pleased to announce this partnership with longtime colleagues at the Royal Academy, said Gary Tintero, the director of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Anne's talent as a curator will no doubt bring projects at the highest level of expertise to both institutions. Tim Marlowe, artistic director of the Royal Academy of Arts added, Anne Dumas is a world-class curator and the partnership between the Royal Academy of Arts London and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston will give Anne a more expansive global stage on which to operate. Over the past 25 years, Anne Dumas has been responsible for a number of major international exhibitions with a focus on her field, 19th and early 20th century art. In addition to her exhibition projects, Anne has acted as a consultant to a wide range of museums throughout Europe and the United States. When interviewed, Anne commented that every exhibition is fraught with problems and difficulties, and it is never dull. Anne was awarded the MBE, Member of the Order of the British Empire, in the 2019 Queen's New Year's Honors List for her services to the arts. She served as the curator of the Hockney Van Gogh exhibition on view earlier this year at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Anne will talk with us about this exhibition today. Please join me in welcoming Anne Dumas. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you about the exhibition Hockney Van Gogh, The Joy of Nature, that was presented at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston earlier this year in the spring. Uh, this exhibition brought together the work of Vincent van Gogh, the, one of the greatest artists working in the late 19th century, with David Hockney, one of the most acclaimed and popular artists working today. Here I show you a photograph of Hockney taken about three years ago by the well-known uh, Dutch photographer Reinecke Dijkstra uh, sitting in his London studio. As you can see immediately, Hockney has always been rather a colorful dresser. He's now aged 84, but he still um, dresses in these bright uh, sweaters and ties and socks. He, he's, as we'll see when we look at his paintings, he's an artist who really loves color and that affects the way he presents himself as well. Um, David Hockney 
has frequently spoken about his love of the work of Van Gogh. He says, I've always been inspired by Van Gogh, and it's not hard to see the connection. Although these artists are obviously separate in time, they are united by remarkable similarities. Above all, their capacity to look at the world with fresh eyes and their deep love of nature expressed through brilliant colour. I've always found the world quite beautiful, and that's an important thing I share with Van Gogh, Hockney said on many occasions. We both really enjoy looking at the world. There were some 47 works by Hockney in the show, showing with a smaller but select group of works by Van Gogh. And showing them together revealed many connections between these two great modern artists. But before we look in detail at some of the works that were displayed in the exhibition, let me tell you a little bit more about the background of the two artists. Um, David Hockney was born in Bradford in Yorkshire in the north of England in 1937. Brad Bradford had been important as an industrial city in the 19th century, uh, particularly for the manufacture of textiles. But um, in the first half of the 20th century and when Hockney was growing up there in the 1940s and 50s, it had become very uh, run down. It was no longer so powerful as an industrial city. And it was very dirty and grimy. Uh, it, it was a sort of dark, industrial, rather gloomy town. But Hockney always jokes and says that he grew up simultaneously in two places, in Bradford and in Hollywood, because as a boy, he loved the cinema. There was a cinema at the end of his street, and so he immersed himself in the brilliant um, technicolor of modern Hollywood films. In 1955, he went on a school outing to see an exhibition of the work of Van Gogh at uh, Manchester City Art Gallery, and he was completely bowled over by it. And what really struck a chord with him was Van Gogh's use of colour. He then won a scholarship to the prestigious art school in London, the Royal College of Art, where he went as a student in the 1960s, part of the swinging 60s in London. And he rapidly became a star of the swinging 60s, uh, creating his very individual persona, dyeing his hair blonde and wearing his famous large round-rimmed spectacles. Um, but in, the, in, in 1964, about, he moved to uh, California, to Los Angeles, uh, partly because of his love of the cinema and he had absorbed this romantic vision of California from the movies. And he, wa he wanted to escape this sort of darkness of the north of England and of Bradford and, and escape to the brilliant color and light of California. So here he did a number of what now his now famous uh, swimming pool paintings. And then in the 1990s, his wonderful series of these enormous uh, panoramic paintings of the Grand Canyon. Uh, Hockney during this time became very distinguished as a designer for the theatre of stage sets, he, particularly for opera. He designed uh, productions for the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Scala in Milan, Covent Garden in London, um, and amongst his most famous were his designs for Stravinsky's The Rake's Progress, Mozart's The Magic Flute, and Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, which we see here. Van Gogh's life story is very different. Um, as I mentioned, uh, David Hockney is still alive and well at the age of 84. Uh, Van Gogh died tragically at the age of only 37. Um, Van Gogh grew up in, the, in Holland. He was born in the small rural town of Zundert in 1853, where his father was a Protestant minister. He died in 1890 at the age of, of, age of 37 after a meteoric career of only 10 years, during which he produced an astonishing body of work. In his early years, he was deeply religious. He worked for the art dealer Goupil in The Hague, London and Paris, but he gave up the art trade to become a lay preacher and then a missionary 
in a very impoverished mining district in southern Belgium. At all of these ventures, he failed. However, in 1880, at the age of 27, he found his true vocation to become an artist. And he was largely self-taught. And once he'd found his path, this artistic path, he pursued it with 100% uh, dedication. To begin with, working in Holland, he concentrated on peasant life, as we see in one of his most um, early, famous early paintings, The Potato Eaters of 1885. And also he developed his skill as a very powerful draftsman by studying um, and drawing peasants working in the field. But none of these works really give any hint of the brilliant artists and colorists that Van Gogh would very soon become. In 1886, he decided he needed to broaden his horizons and he moved to Paris, where his younger brother, Theo Van Gogh, was working as an art dealer. We see in the painting at the top, on the top right, the Boulevard Clichy in Paris that he painted when he first moved to Paris in a dramatic change in his style. This is because he'd come in contact with the Impressionist artists in Paris and also the next generation so-called post-Impressionists and artists like uh, Georges Seurat, who developed a new style of painting with brilliant dots of bright color. And this had an immense effect on Van Gogh. In 1888, he moved down to the south of France to Arles. And here's a painting of the, the house that he rented, the famous yellow house in, in Arles. Um, and from that point, he was no longer living with his brother and he began to write to Theo almost every day, um, often including little sketches of drawings or paintings that he was working on. And he is one of the great artist letter writers of all time. He had great capacity to write very clearly and very expressively about his innermost thoughts and feelings, his philosophy of life, his ideas about art and the way he was making the ideas he was thinking about as he created his painting. So I think there's a really striking parallel here with Hockney moving from the north of Europe, from the north of England, in search of the brilliant color and strong light of California. And uh, earlier in the, in the 19th century, Van Gogh taking a similar path in a way, moving from the sort of darker light and darker climate of Holland to the brilliant light and color of the south of France. And so now we'll turn to look at um, some of the works that were shown in the exhibition. Um, during the time that uh, Hockney was living in California, he would quite often return to England, uh, to Yorkshire, to visit his family, particularly uh, his mother. Um, but his mother died in 1999. And then from around 2004, he really started spending more and more time in Yorkshire, buying a house and a studio at a little town called Bridlington on the coast, which is where his mother had lived. And this really brought about a major turning point in his work. For the next decade or so, he really largely stopped painting in California and embraced the Yorkshire landscape as his principal subject. And um, speaking of this period and his work at this time, Hockney said, in 2004, when I went to Bridlington, a new landscape was seen as something you couldn't do today. That's what they said. You couldn't do it today. I thought, well, why? Because the landscape has become so boring. It's not the landscape that's boring. It's the depictions of it that have become boring, I thought. I mean, you can't be bored of nature, can you? You've got endless subjects of nature, endless, and Van Gogh knew that. And of course, what he's referring to here, Hockney, is that at the time he's working, now in the late um, 1990s, early first decade or so of uh, 2000s, um, a lot of avant-garde contemporary art has really been dominated by the notion of conceptual art, art that is about ideas or philosophical concepts rather than just the sheer looking at the material world. And Hockney has really always swum against the tide of this. 
Um, and so when he's evolving as an artist in the second half of the 20th century, painting nature directly in a naturalistic way had really largely lost its meaning for the avant-garde, but not for Hockney. Uh, he began by sort of reacquainting himself with his native Yorkshire landscape. And he went out into the fields, the countryside and the roads, taking with him a small box of watercolours, which you know, is a very um, uh, portable medium, and you have to work with it rather quickly, so that he could record quite quickly all these scenes and visions that were striking him so forcibly, as he really reacquainted himself and kind of fell in love again with the countryside in which he'd grown up. Um, he was really discovered the light in England, which is so different, of course, from the light of California, because it changes all the time. You know, England is a small island. The weather is very uh, changeable and unpredictable. So the light and the atmosphere are constantly shifting. I also think it's interesting that Hockney chose to work in the medium of watercolour, uh, because traditionally the, the watercolour has been very much associated with the great English watercolourists of the 19th century, such as Turner and Constable, whom uh, Hockney was well aware of. And um, he was very much inspired, as I said, by this soft, constantly changing light. We can look at a little bit more detail at two of this large series of watercolours shown here. He said about these, to see another light is a very good thing. Uh, to get the excitement of the landscape back is what he said he was doing in these watercolours. I went painting outdoors just to find a new kind of language. Um, one thing that Hockney's always said he admires very much about the work of Van Gogh is Van Gogh's capacity to make marks, the tremendous variety of marks and strokes and dots and dashes that we, we will see in, in Van Gogh's uh, drawings and in his paintings. And I think we see Hockney doing very much the same kind of thing here in these uh, watercolours, particularly the one on the right, perhaps, where you see all the different uh, strokes he's used to, keep, to, to create the texture of these different grasses in the foreground. Um, you, when we, you first come into the first gallery of this exhibition, you were confronted by this really beautiful painting by Van Gogh, filled with irises near Arles, um, which we borrowed from the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And we were very pleased to be able to borrow the preparatory drawing uh, for this painting which can, comes from the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, what Hockney said, one reason he thinks that people love Van Gogh's paintings is for the colour and the expressiveness, but also because you can see how they're made. You can really see and understand every stroke. This is a very beautiful painting, I think, by Van Gogh. It's looking across a, a field of corn, with or wheat with uh, irises, a beautiful band of irises uh, stretching diagonally across the foreground with the blue sky and then the, just in, in the distance on the horizon, the, tower, the buildings of the, the town of Arles. Um, Van Gogh described this painting in one of his many letters to his brother Theo. Um, he sent a meadow full of very yellow buttercups, a ditch with its iris plants, with green leaves, with purple flowers, the town in the background, some grey willow trees, a strip of blue sky, a little town surrounded by countryside, entirely covered in yellow and purple flowers. It really is an example, a great example of Van Gogh's capacity for very intense looking. He absorbs every blade of grass, yet the composition is beautifully organised as a whole. The band of irises really holds the foreground while the field stretches away to the buildings in the distance. And we can see so, you know, quite a strong similarity with the painting by Van Gogh we were just looking at and a number of these landscapes that Hockney starts to paint in Yorkshire in 2005 and 2006. And um, having first sort of acquainted himself with the Yorkshire landscape in his watercolours, he then began to paint larger canvases in oil, 
such as we see here, taking his easel and canvases right out into the field and painting directly from nature on the spot. Another example here, this wonderful contrast between this hot um, orangey gold of high summer and the blue sky with studding white clouds above. And again, this wonderful mark making where he's made this sort of foreground of the green uh, grasses and leaves at the front. Um, a painting by Van Gogh, just called The Rocks. Uh, this actually belongs to the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. Um, and I show it here again as another really outstanding example of Van Gogh's capacity for mark making in the texture of the rocks and the grasses and the way that the two um, sort of fit together. You can tell it's, it has a very sort of graphic quality, again, which is something that um, Hockney has often commented on it in, in Van Gogh's work. And we see a similar effect really in this wheat field off Worldgate, another Yorkshire landscape of 2006 by Hockney. And late in the summer, he starts to paint just this single stretch of road, a little country lane that he returns to again and again, painting it at different times of the year. Um, so here it's in July in the high summer, he, and he gave uh, this particular group of paintings the title of a tunnel because the, the greenery is so lush and dense that it grows up on either side of the road, almost forming a tunnel. And here we have a very similar scene but painted in autumn. So you see how he's adjusted his palette to the warm uh, gold russet tones of autumn with a kind of carpet of fallen autumnal leaves in the foreground. And trees are another very important uh, theme or subject to both Hockney and Van Gogh. And the second uh, section of the exhibition was devoted to their paintings and drawings of trees. Um, Van Gogh um, often expressed his belief in what he saw as an almost spiritual quality of trees, writing in one of his letters, sometimes I long so much to do landscape, just as one would go for a long walk to refresh oneself. And in all of nature, in trees, for instance, I see expression and a soul. Hockney is equally passionate about trees. He says each one is as individual as a person. He says they can't be tamed. The branches just go all over the place and cannot be dictated to by the laws of perspective. And um, walking in the woods near Worldgate, which is a very ancient uh, area of East uh, Yorkshire, he was struck once by the presence of a dead tree standing amidst autumn undergrowth. Uh, returning some time later, he discovered that the tree had been cut down, but not completely cut down, just leaving this sort of stump of a tree trunk. And he found in this tree, or the remains of this tree, a very poignant sense of dignity. And he, began, he explored it in a number of charcoal drawings, um, two of which I show you here. You see he's rather poignantly called this stump of a tree and one of the drawings just still there. The tree is, hasn't been completely uh, destroyed. And you see, I think you'd see this wonderful energy and vigor and the variety of Hockney's own mark, mark making. I mean, he may have a, it very much admired Van Gogh as a draftsman, but he is a brilliant draftsman himself. I think as you'll see with the amazing shade of tones between black and white through different shades of darker and softer gray, as well as the vitality of the individual strokes. And here is a drawing just of a single tree still standing with rather full uh, foliage uh, by Van Gogh. Uh, Van Gogh's technique was different. Um, Hockney very often uses charcoal for his drawings, whereas Van Gogh developed a very uh, original technique of using reed pens. He actually made these reed pens himself just by cutting reeds from the side of a road and then cutting the end of the reed to make a nib, the pointed shape of a nib. And then he would work uh, with ink. So pen and, this is a pen and ink drawing, but I think you can see this great variety in 
range of texture and strokes. Um, after a while, uh, Hockney began to make much larger paintings of trees. These large paintings are not done on the spot, but in the studio and often made up of more than one panel. So the one painting on the left, uh, more fell trees on Worldgate is made up of two uh, panels, which he's joined together. Um, and you see that he's using a very uh, unusual palette um, in these paintings, this yellow and purple and greens, and the tree stump is this sort of deep mauveish pink, rather unnatural colors. But I think um, it's because when he's working in the studio away from the motif, he can allow his magic imagination more rain to work with colors that are not necessarily tied closely to the actual colors in nature, but that allow a certain kind of emotional expressiveness. And here we get, uh, I show you a picture of Hockney actually painting uh, the work on the left, so you just sort of get a sense of, of the scale of it. And a painting by Van Gogh of 18, 1889, which I think also really expresses his emotional reaction to trees and perhaps the death of trees. This is called Pine Trees at Sunset. And you can see on the right that the, it, the tree appears to be partly dying. There are these broken and ravaged branches. And so it becomes in some ways um, an emblem, a symbol, if you like, of the transience of existence, the transience of life. Um, he wrote to his brother Theo about this particular painting, mentioning the superb effects of pale citrons, citron yellow skies uh, against behind the desolated pines. Um, Van Gogh painted this in um, 1889. By this time, as, as I'm sure you all know, that at the end of his year of living in Arles in 1888 ended rather dramatically and tragically because the artist Gauguin had gone to live and work with him for the last three months of the year. And the, they did not get on particularly well as a sort of clash of two big egos. And in the end, there was a fight. Um, Gauguin left immediately for Paris and Van Gogh cut off part of his ear. And this was the first of the psychotic episodes that would really um, dog him for the rest of his short life. And in, in eight, the spring of 1889, he admitted himself to a psychiatric hospital in Saint-Rémy-de-Provence, not a town quite near to Arles, where he would spend um, most of the next year. And, and, and where he suffered a, a, quite a lot of breakdowns. It's not entirely clear exactly what, what the nature of Van Gogh's illness was. At the time, he was diagnosed as epileptic. I think now um, psychiatrists tend to think he was bipolar, maybe schizophrenic. It's not totally clear. Anyway, um, but when he was in a very manic state or in a very depressed state, he didn't really work. He only kind of worked in the, the more uh, calmer, more lucid intervals in between when he was allowed out of the uh, clinic and he would paint in the landscape outside around, which is clearly what he's done here. But I think there's this sort of emotional intensity that we so often find in, in Van Gogh and which is one of the things that makes him such a great artist who still communicates so powerfully to audiences today. And this is lovely painting in the exhibition, one of my favorites really by Van Gogh, uh, painted in 1890, the last year of his life, called Tree Trunks in the Grass. And we have this in the section of the exhibition called Close Looking. And because Van Gogh was obsessed with getting really, really in to looking at the te textures very, closely in nature. And here he's taken a very unusual viewpoint. It's almost as if he's lying flat, actually lying down on his stomach, looking up in this woodland that's absolutely carpeted with spring flowers. 
and the texture that he's used to create the bark of the trees with these powerful orange strokes that really bring them to life. I'm afraid you can't really appreciate fully in the slide. You have to see the painting, but I can assure you that this is a, this is a wonderfully felt and, and textured painting. And it's very interesting in the same uh, space, so very near that painting, we were able to show some of David Hockney's sketchbooks um, in which he also is looking very closely at nature, uh, recording here the sort of in, in the lower drawing, the actual sort of structure of certain uh, flowers and grasses, and then adding a uh, color in the other sketchbook. And here's a beautiful drawing that we had in the show uh, by Van Gogh called Garden with Weeping Tree, Arles. Uh, this was just an ordinary little public park, little public garden in Arles, near the yellow house where Van Gogh was living at the time. But he did a whole series of drawings and paintings of this park that he called the Poet's Garden. And it's very typical of Van Gogh that he can bring poetic associations to often quite ordinary subjects. But I think what's really remarkable about this drawing, again, done with an ink and a reed pen, is the incredible variety of strokes. You see all these dots and dashes, the way he's created the falling leaves of the willow tree. He's used very tiny little dots to create the sense of atmosphere and light <coughs> in the sky beyond. And then we get this sort of rippling effect in these diagonal bands in the foreground that suggest wind uh, blowing through the grass. And then we have a wonderful series of drawings, 25 drawings by Hockney, called The Arrival of Spring in 2013. Um, these drawings should be read horizontally, left to right, one row at a time, because what he's done is in each one of these rows, it's the same place in a particular stretch of woodland that he's recorded over the course of a year as, as the seasons change. So if we just take the top row, for example, you've got uh, after a heavy rainfall, probably in, uh, in the winter, we can see the trees reflected in the water. The next is a fully winter scene with snow. And then the third one, we've got just the, the trees beginning to come out in leaf, like you see particularly in the tree on the right. It's a little bit more advanced in, in the fourth drawing. And then in the fifth one, we have um, summer fading out, fading over, falling over into autumn. So each of these rows has a sort of a narrative sequence through the seasons. And Hockney was really always uh, fascinated by uh, the change of the seasons, the way change, nature changes with each uh, season. And that's something that he very much um, appreciated about working in England, because um, although obviously there are seasons in California, but they're not nearly so marked, not so markedly different as the four seasons are in, in England. Uh, this is a, not one of the series, this is a larger independent drawing by Hockney, but of the same kind of woodland. And I just show it to you uh, because I think she gets a marvellous sense of light, you know, he's not using colour here, but he's still getting a wonderful sense of the light of nature, the way it filters through these trees. And another close-up view of trees, very similar approach really, in this um, little painting by Van Gogh. And what Hockney particularly loved and was most excited by uh, was the arrival of spring. Um, this is called May Blossom on the Roman Road, painted in 2009, uh, painted in the studio. And as you can see, I think even in the slide, it's a very large canvas, but it's made up of four separate panels, which he then uh, joins together. Uh, it's called the Roman Road because Yorkshire was actually occupied by the Romans at, at one point, and they built a lot of roads through, throughout of England. Um, so he's got um, what, this incredible sort of energy here. You can see the trees are almost kind of bursting with blossom. And he gets, he found it absolutely intoxicating, the spring. And it, he said that the, the days when the blossom, the May blossom is at its height, is really only a few days. He, he used to refer to it as action week. 
and he would get up very early in the morning uh, to capture the light, to capture the blossom as, as well as he could. And he, he once said rather charmingly that um, he felt so excited when he was walking and driving in this landscape. It was as if somebody had gone along and poured champagne over the bushes. Um, so he's not painting this directly from nature. He's heightened the whole thing to capture more than what the scene actually looked like. It just does not look like a sort of photographic um, presentation of this scene. It's, it's what Hockney saw combined with what he feels. And I think in this, if you look at the sky, you see these almost sort of whirling patterns of pink dots against the blue sky. Um, which is very much a, a technique that he's picking up on from Van Gogh. And this is an orchard, a spring painting by, painted by Van Gogh in 1888, which really reminds me of Hockney's. I think their approach to the spring is very parallel. They were both felt tremendous excitement and exultation at the arrival of spring. And when Van Gogh first arrived in Arles in 1888, it was the spring, and within a, just a few weeks of his arrival, all of the orchards around Arles burst into blossom. And he wrote to his brother, Theo, I'm in a flurry of work because the trees are in blossom, and I wanted to do a landscape art of tremendous gaiety. And I think tremendous gaiety is what Hockney is about too. Just the sheer joy and exaltation that both artists are able to express in their response to the arrival of spring. We now move on to a very different section of the exhibition, uh, which we've called Experiments with the iPad. I expect, as you know, Hockney's always been interested in the creative possibilities of the camera and of technology. He's constantly explored uh, new techniques, new technologies in his picture making, and how to use them to reinvent the language of art. He was a fan of the iPad since the beginning. He acquired one in 2009, and he particularly liked an app called Brushes, which I believe no longer exists, but somehow um, Hockney's managed to get a, a device so that he can still use it. He says, I found the Brushes app and started drawing on the iPhone. It gave me great freedom. I can use it anywhere, even in bed. He draws with a stylus on the screen, and then the drawings are printed on paper in a larger format mounted on board. But he finds that he can get extraordinarily uh, vivid and colorful effects using the iPad technique. And actually now today, he, it's almost become uh, his principal technique. He loves it so much, he finds it so liberating. And so here we see him again going through the seasons, two in January, one in April. Here are three more, May, April, and April again, again, really celebrating the spring in these brilliant colours. Um, and he got into the habit, very nice habit, of sending one of these drawings every day to the whole circle of his friends to brighten up their day. And he said rather amusingly that if Van Gogh had had an iPad, um, he would have been sending iPad drawings to his brother, Theo, rather than doing um, little sketches in his letters. And here we have two of a series of uh, six uh, much larger iPad drawings, still made in the same way, do a, paint, a drawing with the stylus directly onto the screen, but then printed in much larger format. And then I think this huge painting, uh, is really probably the star of the exhibition, the arrival of spring in Woldgate, East Yorkshire in 2011. It's an enormous uh, painting made up of 32 canvases put together. And we're very lucky that the Centre Pompidou in Paris agreed to let it travel to Houston for the exhibition. And here I think we see Hockney working in a, a different mode. Um, because here he's clearly looking at nature. I mean, in fact, the subject is very like the painting I showed you by, by Van Gogh, Tree Trunks in the Grass. We, we're looking at the tree trunks again, but not the top of the trees, uh, rising up out of this carpet of spring flowers. 
Um, so obviously, Hockney is thinking of a scene from nature, but it's very much filtered through his imagination. And I think the stylization of it is very uh, rather formal, decorative arabesques that he makes with the tree branches and the very detailed dis depiction of the flowers and grasses and above all this brilliant colour is coming very much out of his experiments with the iPad and the kind of colours that he was able to develop using the iPad technique. And of course, the, the massive scale of this work and the way it kind of draws you in as an immersive experience can be related to his earlier experience um, as a theatre designer, working on a very big scale in strong colour, in creating large um, scenographies that really would pull in a live audience. I think there's a residue of that kind of work in these, these monumental paintings that Hockney does around this time. Here's another, not quite such a big one, but a similar idea of trees rising up out of a flowery forest floor against, again, this sort of heightened colour. You know, the trees are not really purple or magenta, but he's, he's doing that to create a powerful, decorative and expressive effect. Uh, he was fascinated, as I've said, by the change in the seasons. And in 2006, he did a series, large series of nine large canvases, each made up of six panels, charting the evolution of the seasons throughout a single year. We had four of them, which I show you here in, on view at the exhibition. Um, they all focus on the same place, a place in a woodland where three footpaths meet. Uh, so here we've got early spring. Uh, this is a, a, more later in the spring, May. Then we've got high summer in July, and then this very autumnal one uh, in November. And so these are, you know, very much, and you can see how he's really played with the idea of these long, low shadows that you get uh, later in the year into, into the fall. And here we have a painting using a very similar sort of colour of russets, um, a much smaller painting uh, by Van Gogh, painted in the garden of the asylum where he was living in 1889. He loved autumn as much, almost as much as he loved spring. He said, I sometimes long for a country where it would always be autumn. This is actually quite a small painting and that brings me on to Pat's point out the, the exhibition is largely about trying to bring out the correspondences and the parallels between Hockney and Van Gogh, of which there are many. But of course, one does have to think of the differences. Hockney painted on a much bigger scale than Van Gogh ever did. You know, Van Gogh just did not conceive of painting, paint very, very large works made up of multiple panels. You know, that wasn't really part of his visual vocabulary. And also though Van Gogh was a brilliant colorist for his time, he really pushed color perhaps more further than any other artist in by the time of his death in 1890 had done. But Hockney has a different range of uh, techniques and colors, you know, acrylic paint, for example, at his disposal, not to mention the iPad. Uh, which um, achieves, you know, even bolder and more brilliant colour than Van Gogh did. Uh, this, again, I think is one of the most extraordinary uh, works in the show. Again, the theme is the Four Seasons, but this is a video piece uh, made from 2010 to 2011. Um, and what Hockney did, he arranged to have nine cameras mounted to the top of a car he sat in the back seat sort of directing, like a film director, what would happen. And this car just drove very, very slowly up and down a short stretch of road, the same road in each of the four seasons, uh, just very, uh, uh, this little country lane back and forth, just filming. And each, you'll see that, you can see the nine, e e each season. So we've got winter at the lower right, um, autumn lower left, spring upper left, and summer upper right. And each square, you see the nine nine segments of each one is, is what was filmed by each of the nine cameras is exactly the same in each of the four images of the four seasons. 
but you just get this very, very slow motion. It's completely hypnotic and, and really pulls you in. It's like a sort of experience of meditation. And um, many of the people who came to see the exhibition in Houston really loved it and would sit. We had benches in the middle of the room and then one of these screens on each of the four walls. And they would sit just totally absorbed and just pulled into this extraordinarily kind of quiet and peaceful, hypnotic and beautiful experience. The final section of the exhibition is called In Perspective. Hockney has always been fascinated by the idea of perspective and has actually done quite a lot of research and study on the way artists in the past, the old master painters, used various devices like the camera lucida, for example, or the camera obscura to work out how to get a vanishing point of a single point perspective. But he's also said that he finds traditional perspective, which had sort of dominated a Western landscape painting since the Renaissance, um, rather confining. And so he invented a new technique called reverse perspective, which we see here, and brilliant color to suggest uh, this scene. Um, here's a painting by um, of Hockney's sort of homage to the Dutch 17th century painter, Meindert Hobbema. And he's really kind of almost sending up the one point perspective here. It was a famous painting. I show you the a 17th century painting in the National Gallery in London, where there's this sort of vanishing point just down this avenue of trees. But Hockney kind of de deconstructs it, opening it up so that the clouds and the fields on the side become all flattened out like decorative panels. And then the show ends with this amazing, huge work called In the Studio. It's actually a photographic work. It's an enormous photograph of Hockney's studio with him standing rather proudly in the middle in his uh, brightly colored striped sweater. And you know many of his works around him, we see some of the Grand Canyon pictures. Uh, out above, we see one of his, uh, an old master, his take on a Fra Angelico Annunciation. Um, and he, he, what he did was he, working with his technical team, took these three-dimensional photographs of all the individual objects, which are then sort of digitally dropped into this large photographic space. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I think you can see it's wonderful that Hockney is still such an amazingly vigorous and inventive artist at the age of 84. He gets up every day, he works in his studio, now living in France, and he says he's just going to keep going until he stops. And I hope that will be some time away. Thank you very much for listening. Anne, I am a fan of color as well as the seasons, so I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation and insights into Hockney. I want to thank you for agreeing to take questions from our viewers. Our first question today, can you tell us a little more about Hockney's decision to move to Los Angeles in the 60s? Did he know anyone in LA? And about how long did he stay there? Well, um, it started quite early. When, when Hockney was growing up as a boy in uh, Manchester, uh, in, in Bradford, I mean, an industrial town in the north of England in the 1950s, um, he used to go to the cinema at the end of the street almost every day and watch Hollywood Technicolor films. And he always joked and said, oh, well, you know, I grew up in Bradford, but in Hollywood at the same time. Um, and so when he graduated from art school in London in 1962, I think it had always been his dream to move to uh, Los Angeles. I don't know if he particularly knew anyone th there, but he probably did because Hockney was a superstar very young. When he was in his 20s, he became quite quickly a kind of pop idol in, in England. So he went to California and fell absolutely in love with the California way of life, the quality of uh, the light, the swimming pools, etc. painted a number of swimming pool paintings. And the most famous one is called A Bigger Splash. 
And so he moved there in 1964. And he lived there pretty much on and off until uh, most of the time it was his home until 1999, so about 35 years. But he was always moving around. He was coming back to London and Paris. But Los Angeles was his home, uh, first of all, in the Hollywood Hills. And then he had a big beach place at uh, Malibu. Thank you. I have another question from another viewer. How did Hockney get involved in opera and stage set design? Um, well, he always loved opera. He's always loved opera and knew a great deal about it. So he had a lot of friends in the opera world in, in uh, London. And actually, it, the first play that he designed was a play called a sort of surreal, surrealistic play, uh, which he put on at the Royal Court Theatre in London in very early in 1966. And I think through his connections with the opera, he was invited to design operas. And I think the big breakthrough for him came in 1978, when he was invited by the very prestigious Glyndebourne Opera Company in England to design uh, sets for Mozart's The Magic Flute. And from then on, he got invitations from all over the world, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, uh, the Opera in San Francisco, the Scala in Milan, etc. He doesn't really do that, do it now, but he did do a lot of stage design, particularly for opera in the 1970s and 1980s. Thank you, Anne. Another question. Can you elaborate on how Hockney works on his iPad? What app does he use? Um, he started using the iPad in about 1999 and he used an app that was called Brushes, you know, for painting and colouring. And then I think that they discontinued Brushes, but somehow he, he came to some arrangement with the creator of that particular app so that he could go on using it or a form of it. And he keeps his iPad in his pocket all the time and he draws on it with a stylus on the screen. And he loves the range of colors that are, that are offered and, and textures as well via this app called Brushes. Um, and then uh, when he's made the iPad drawing by some quite clever digital process, I think worked out by his own, he has a whole technical team working with him. Uh, the drawings are then printed on paper and can be enlarged to any size really, and then mounted on board. Fascinating, fascinating. And one final question from our viewers. How large are the arrival of these spring panels? Um, are you talking about the iPad drawing still here? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, in, the, in the exhibition, we had two series of the iPad drawings. We had a series of 12 that were the, the smaller size, and those are, each one is 55 by 41 inches. And then we had six of a much larger size, and those were 93 by 70 inches. But I think in a way you could make them as big or as small as you wanted. But those are the two formats that Hockney seems to have chosen. Thank you, Anne, for your insightful and informative lecture. The colors on the slides were vivid, brilliant, and quite simply magnificent. The Norfolk Society of Arts Board regrets that we were unable to personally host you in Norfolk but we do so appreciate the coordination it is required on your part to present your lecture virtually today. I'm happy to share with all of our viewers that Anne's lecture will remain on our NSA website throughout our 2021-2022 season. Our next lecture will be held on Wednesday, October the 27th at 11 o'clock. We feel fortunate at that time to welcome Daniel, Daniel Finnamore, Associate Director, Exhibitions, the Russell W. Knight Curator of Maritime Art and History at the Peabody Essex Museum. Dr. Finnamore will speak with us on In American Waters, the Sea in American Painting. Please remember that you can always find the most current information about our upcoming lectures on our website, NorfolkSocietyOfArts.org. Again, thank you for attending our lecture today. 
be safe and stay well. All the best to each of you.